You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hello, this is Dr. Carrie Bedian, and I will be your host of Fertility Docs Uncensored, dun, 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 this week. <laughs> And I am here with uh, Dr. Susan Hudson of Texas Fertility Center, as well as Dr. Abby Eblen of Nashville Fertility Center. And we are going to be bringing in one of my patients a little bit later to talk about her journey with fertility treatment and decision to become a single mom and how all of that played out. But um, before she gets here, um, my I got some sleep last night. I didn't get a whole lot of sleep last night because of uh, sexual encounters that were occurring in my house. And <laughs> it's really unfortunate that, well, maybe not really so unfortunate. So who all is in your house, Carrie? So it's me. My other half are two children, three-year-old and six-year-old. Our dog, Gigi, who oh. is a chihuahua, so part chihuahua, part wiener dog. And then we are puppy sitting... Uh, a little boy dog named Duke. Oh, uh, was Duke getting a little action? Duke is trying his hardest, and Gigi <laughs> is just shutting that boy down <laughs> like it is her job. I mean, she's enjoying it because I see a very enthusiastic tail wagging. But until we created Duke last night, he was uh, very amorous all the time. And the the pup won't take no for an answer. Like she just swats his nose and bats his ears and pushes him away. And he'll go away for 30 seconds, maybe. Wow. Maybe. How, old is, how, how old is he? He's, he's still under a year. I think he's about nine months or so. Mm. But he's, he's a boy. A, but he's a boy. He's a boy. He clearly cannot help himself. <laughs> Do you guys have dogs at home? Do you have pets? I do. I have a miniature schnauzer named Sage. Aww. She's a sweetheart. Aww. Do you have any any small creatures, Abby? I have two cats, both rescue. And we had sort of a similar circumstance. We have a boy cat that's older. We have a girl cat that is about was about six months old last month. Mm-hmm. And we were planning on having her spayed. And unfortunately, right before we were going to do it, she I went to heat. Kittens. Oh, well, no, 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 because because <laughs> my my male cat is fade, but same sort of thing. She she'd like purr and roll around and make all oh. these little cooing noises, and she was really cute. My teenager's like, oh, she's so sweet, and she's been rubbing on us, and she's so nice. Oh, and geez. finally, we had to break the news to him. We think she's in heat. So <laughs> that's had, one way to have the birds and bees talk with your. Yeah, your well, kids. they they kind of had. Unfortunately, with a mom as a fertility doctor, yeah. they they've had that talk before. Yeah. Do you carry a uterus around in your purse as well? My kids pull not my uterus, but my model <laughs> uterus out of my purse I, whenever you know, I'm lecturing. I've never done that students. before. I've never done that before. Yeah. It's um when you're looking for your keys or your wallet in the grocery store and you pull your uterus and set it out on the <laughs> counter, you get looks. I bet. You yeah. totally get looks. All right. So I would like to introduce both of you to Annette, who is one of my patients, who is just lovely. She's been with me how long, Annette? Since February. Since February of last year. That's right. Where we just hit the one year mark. Yep. And and so we have had quite the up and down ride. And um, Annette is a local Las Vegas native. And I feel like at this point, I have met your, not just your family, but your whole social circle at this point. Exactly. It's very important to have such an amazing support system around you when you're going through something this important. Mm -hmm. And so who all did you bring with you to your appointments over the course of our past year together? So I brought my mom, obviously my dad, and a few of my girlfriends who are also your patients. And one of the girls that was with me at most of my appointments was my best friend, Megan. And she was pregnant. So I figured if I brought somebody who I could rub their belly while I'm going through all this, <laughs> uh-huh. it would give me good luck. Uh-huh. So she was with me during a lot of my IUIs and then the final egg retrieval, mm-hmm. which was almost what two weeks ago now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 So your, your mom is a force to be reckoned yes, with. She, she is. is a powerful lady. She's one tough cookie. And how, so, 
so she's not just your mom. She's also your boss. My boss. Yes. So how does that roll? So it's really hard because we obviously work together, but we cannot live together together. Eight hours a day is enough. (laughs) Um, And then taking her to my fertility appointments was even more than enough. Um, She plays an important role, obviously, in all of my decision making with Uh this. But um, she's kind of groomed me to be a tough girl, just like her ever since I was young. So um, yeah, it's... uh, What's it's, your family tough, business? Like, what do so you guys do together? My family business. She's owned a security company for forty years in Las Vegas, uh-huh. and that would be a tough job in Las Vegas. Yes, we have almost four, five hundred employees. Oh my goodness! And she's been running it by herself this whole time, and she's just large and in charge, and so she's probably packing. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> that's scary that's scary um but yeah it's uh it's it's good I like having her as a mom who's groomed me to be in this position where I am now um so yeah so what how would you describe quote unquote this position that you're in now um to be a to have that option right now I'm 34 to be a single mom is just um it was kind of an easy decision for me because she's groomed me to not depend on a man you have to take care of yourself never have to depend on somebody you have to do things for yourself nobody else is going to take care of you except for you in life. Mm-hmm. It's almost like nobody's going to take care of you. Like in a plane, got to put your oxygen mask on first and then you can take care of other people. Mm-hmm. So she's um, always told me that I have to have something to fall back on as far as college and life and things like that, college degree, but always, you know, do things for yourself. Mm-hmm. So, But you, I mean, you are a beautiful, smart, talented, dynamic woman. It's not like you have any lack of options by any stretch of the imagination. Because I remember when you first came in, there was some discussion. It was pretty brief, but there was still a little bit of discussion about, okay, you know, do you have a partner? And part of that's important for me to ask because Nevada state laws, and I think Texas and Tennessee Tennessee as well, whenever we're talking about fertility treatment with a woman who is planning on using donor sperm, which is what, you know, all of our single moms are are doing, we have to make sure that you're not legally married because that binds that man who is the legal partner to support that child. And so I... Of course, as with any fertility doc, we get nosy very quickly on a first date right? and, <laughs> and ask all and these you questions. Did. Yeah. And I did. Um, because I need to make sure that you're not legally married. Because right. if you are, that means that we need to set other paperwork in place and, and get some other legal action. And so, um, and those laws are similar in both Texas and, and Tennessee. Yeah. And do you guys know if there's similar around the country or is it state by state? I assume it's state by state, but I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not familiar outside of Texas what the laws yeah. are. I think most fertility docs, just as a matter of course, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with judgment. It's just a, right. we want to make sure that we are protecting everybody involved. And whenever you're using a sperm donor, you want to make sure that the legal and social obligations are in place from the very beginning. And so if it's a sperm donor, he needs to know that he's not going to be held liable for child support. And that woman needs to know that he doesn't have any parenting rights. And so um, so we got pretty nosy on on our first date because... So can, I, I can I interject a question here? Yeah. So how much did you know about ways, options to conceive before you came to see Dr. Obedient. The options are out there if you Google and like Dr. B said, we, you know, you get personal. If you ask friends of friends, so many people have gone through it. And I think now that I'm, you know, in my mid thirties, there's so many other girls out there that have gone through it. You just got to ask. And then, you know, people start op- up opening up about it. It's a pretty small world it when, is. once you start it asking, is. isn't it? Yeah. So what what were you thinking when you first walked into my office? Like, how did you see this going? Because I know you and you had a vision. I did. I did. I was on a mission. 
Oh my God, you were on a mission. (laughs) I was on a mission. And at first I knew down the road, if I did decide to do IVF, I would have to be poked and prodded, Mm -hmm. like beyond poked and prodded especially. And I was afraid of needles. So I thought, okay, let's go in and let's try the most easy route, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, let's do IUIs first just to see if that would work because wow, that's easy, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I did three of those and they didn't work. Did you ever look into using known donors at all? Did you ever think about that or? So difference between a known donor, when, when we first started talking, we were talking directly about sperm banks. Right. And And so the difference between a sperm bank and a known donor is, let's say you had a guy friend that you know and love and whatever, and would have somebody that you know be your sperm donor. Absolutely not. I did not (laughs) want to have anybody I knew. I wanted somebody that I didn't know just because I didn't want to have to answer to anybody. Mm -hmm. I didn't want somebody to have a say. So how did you find that sperm bank? How did you choose your donor? I, again, I asked around, I asked your office, you and I spoke about it, and I actually went through two sperm banks. Mm -hmm. So um, the first one was, oh my gosh, I can't even remember now. It was out of Georgia. Names are important. Yeah. Okay. And then I used another one, Zytec. And when I used Zytec, that was how I got pregnant was through that donor. So as a physician, you know, we refer patients to sperm banks. But, you know, quite honestly, I really don't know the patient's experience when they look on the bank. Tell me kind of what you saw on the website and what you, what, cho- what helps you choose your donor essentially. Okay. So I knew in my mind as a little girl, what I wanted my husband to look like. And they're really cool. Cause you could go on and you could pick height, hair color, anything you want. It's you like can, going shopping. It's, it is. It's the like online, online shopping. shopping. <laughs> yes. So I knew I wanted somebody tall, dark, and handsome, and you can narrow them down super quick by just clicking on the options. Do you get pictures? You do. You have to pay a little more, which I paid for top of the line membership. I want to know everything. And you do. I think you know more about that person at the end. And then you could print it all out, which I did to keep in my baby book Uh once I finally picked the donor. But I wanted somebody that you know, was educated, tall, dark hair, came from a great family. It tells you even the mom's history, health history, the dad's health history, what the brothers and sisters do for work. I mean, you know everything about this person. What about things the donor likes to do or hobbies Yeah, interests, hobbies, everything. Interesting, okay. So that's how I picked it. And I feel like people from the Midwest are the nicest people. So I'm like, (laughs) okay, I'm going to get a guy. My husband's Midwestern, so I'll have to agree with that. Yes, mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to get a guy from the Midwest who's tall, dark, and handsome and cross my fingers and I'm good to go. So that's how I picked it. But we used two different sperm donors. We did. Now, what was that? Because that was not an easy transition from donor number one to donor I number two. I put my brakes on with you after the first one, remember? And I said, oh, yes. I'm not switching. This is not going to happen. And then Big Mama stepped in. <laughs> remember? <laughs> oh, yes. And I, I remember that consultation very well. she went into the fertility clinic behind my back and told Dr. B and the girls at the front desk, she needs to switch or we're done here. Oh, see, I don't remember it being behind your back because I remember her sitting right next to you in the appointment. She said it a couple of times. And she, <laughs> she was very adamant about the switching. She was very clear yeah. that that's what her opinion was on the matter. Right. right. So then I had to go back and it's such a process, you know? So I went back and I found another one. I'm like, okay, fine. We'll use this one. And it was pretty much the same thing. So let me ask you this. You had your family really involved and they knew what was going on. And I personally think that's a great idea. I think openness is a really good thing. But in retrospect, if you had to look back on it, would you have had your mom as involved as she was? No. (laughs) (laughs) The question is, did you really have much control over that given your family dynamics? Right. I think I might have maybe hit a couple of those appointments and saved Dr. B and I, (laughs) you know, some headaches. Um, because she was so, so involved. And, you know, 
I, sh- I would have had my mom less involved and my dad more involved because my dad is, and as Dr. B knows, my biggest fan, my biggest cheerleader at every appointment, sits in the waiting room. Oh, he was so cute. He brought us muffins on yes. retrieval day. Yes, dad. yes. And he is so excited that now I'm pregnant. So it's, um, oh, yeah, I think you, I would You gave it away. I know. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was, I maybe would have had my mom less involved involved and my mom, my dad more involved. But you went through, so we did the three IUI cycles. Three IUIs. And then had the conversation of, okay, this is not just a, what I like to think of as a permanent lack of male factor in needing to use a sperm donor. Um, And we decided that we were going to do in vitro. Right. And that was not the straightforward process that we anticipated. So with just a basic insemination, we had talked pretty thoroughly about all right, in the best case scenario, your chances of success are typically about 12 to 15% per cycle. And that is pretty fitting because the normal conception rate for a male-female couple who are having intercourse regularly is somewhere in the 20-25% range for someone who's in her early 30s like you are. But even when you're doing IUIs, it's better than no sperm exposure at all, but it's still not a slam dunk. And so when we got into IVF, both of us were thinking, okay, your egg count's pretty reasonable. Everything else, your testing was dead on. There was nothing that was really remarkable. There's a problem here. And then we got into the IUI or the IVF cycle. Yes, we did. We jumped in. Uh huh. And I did so the three IUIs didn't work, and then I did one egg retrieval with the first sperm. And then we totally switched sperm. And then I did two more egg retrievals and I got five embryos. Mm -hmm. So So you did a total of three IVF cycles. Mm -hmm. Yes. Three retrievals. Which for a 33-year-old... You know, 33, 34 year old as she was going through it was, and I was not doing where we anticipated. Back to back to back to back. So I did an IUI, I gave myself a month break. I did an IUI, gave myself a month break. IUI break straight into IVF. So tell me your emotional state at that point because a lot of people that go through what you went through, you went through three IUI cycles and then three IVF cycles. That's a lot. How, emotionally, a, how did you do that? It was a lot. I think I relied on my girlfriends a lot. And every time I took, you know, the girls at Dr. B's office said, just wait for your blood results. Don't do at home pregnancies. And I know at home pregnancy tests, and I know I shouldn't have, but, but do you, you know how many I did? And every time it didn't come you know, it said not pregnant. It was such a bummer, Mm -hmm. but I just had to like kind of put your boots on and keep going. I couldn't stop at that point because I was so determined. Mm -hmm. When I went into Dr. B's office, I said, I I'm on a mission and there was nothing that was going to stop me. There was just, to me, it was kind of just a hump in the road and let's just keep going. Let's stop this. And we did. We pulled out some secret weapons in the IUIs. Remember, we mm-hmm. did some shots in my stomach to get the eggs even bigger. And we yep. did so many things to make those successful. And then when it didn't work, I'm like, all right, we got to we gotta kick this up a notch. We got to go to the next, the next phase, the next... But what's next? Level. Let's do yeah. it. Yeah. So your first IVF cycle, when we thawed that sperm, we ended up thawing, I want to say two, was it two vials that time? Because the sperm donor that we got, the vial was awful. Mm. And yeah. and it was unexpected because the previous vials that we had during the IUIs were pretty reasonable. Mm-hmm. And typically I have people have a backup vial you know, just in case. But with IVF, it's that balance of at what point do you thaw another vial, which is in the grand scheme of things, not horribly expensive, but it's still several hundred dollars. Right. Donor sperm right. isn't cheap. It no, is not, it's not cheap. It is not cheap. Do, do you mind so, sharing about how much a vial of sperm costs? It was, you know what kills you, believe it or not? Shipping. It's the shipping. Mm-hmm. It's the shipping. Mm-hmm. So once Dr. B told me that she wanted two, I sent two and I told her to de-thaw or to de-thaw, thaw both. 
both. I wanted both because Mm -hmm. I wanted the most amount. Mm -hmm. So with the last two that were actually successful, I did, I sent two Mm -hmm. and it was, I believe 800 per sample. So that's 16. And then the shipping was another, you know, three or 400 bucks. So those were the small vials that you use for IVF, right? Mm-hmm. What about the bigger vials cost-wise that you use for the IVF? Were those, were those IVF those are ready both or were same. they all IVF ready? They were both ready? the same. They were both about the same. Okay. So yeah. they didn't have that particular Maybe 100 donor. Maybe here and there. Yeah. But. That particular donor didn't have a huge difference in what they were charging for the two different types of samples for the, because in every donor bank, you've got IUI samples, which have a higher number of sperm available in them versus the ART or IVF vials, which have a smaller number of sperm. And so when we did the first cycle, that first set of sperm was really not very good. And, but it was that debate of, well, if you've got bad sperm, do you freeze the eggs and put them through an extra Mm freeze-thaw cycle or do you go ahead and do it and hope that the competence of the eggs and how good quality they are makes up for it? And what we didn't know until that point, because there's some things that you don't know until you hit the actual IVF cycle. Susan, you were talking about this on a prior episode of how everything that we learn when you're looking at the diagnostic test and you know maybe a third of that, a half mm-hmm, of that. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't until that first IVF cycle that we realized, okay, there's there's an issue with the eggs too. Right. This is I, not just I always a tell my patients that IVF is not only therapeutic and that we're trying to get you pregnant, but it's also diagnostic. There are some right. things we just don't know until we see eggs and sperm in a dish. And mm-hmm. you know what? Dr. B described it perfect. It's a beauty contest and a talent show. <laughs> <laughs> So, I love that yesterday, one. Actually. Yes, that's exactly yes. how she described it. So you got to keep that in mind. You have to stay positive during all this. You have to have somebody to depend on that you could lean on, to talk to. That's, I think, the most, what got me through this, the most successful part of IVF. Did you ever talk to like a professional counselor or anything like that in preparation for these cycles? I did. I, I talked to a therapist and she is amazing and she's very religious and she prayed with me. And I think she, between her and Dr. B, that's how I got through this. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, to, you know, I think kudos to you for being so disciplined and so just, you know, you said, if, if it doesn't work, I just had to put my boots back on yeah, and keep, keep going. going. Mm-hmm. And I think those are the patients that ultimately are successful because right. it's not an easy road physically right. or emotionally. And I think you express that really well. Right. And you know, if when you, when Dr. B describes exactly what's going on and how these, these medications are affecting your body, it never really affected me. It just, maybe I was a little bit more hungry or not kind of tired, but it was never anything major side effects or anything like that. And trust me, I was doing a lot. And the Mm -hmm. first time when I said I was scared of needles, the first time I did my IVF and I had to put that needle in my stomach, I had to have my girlfriends on FaceTime and we had to have (laughs) a countdown. So you were really scared, yeah. I was so scared. It's a mind game to put a needle in your stomach. It is. I had to literally have them on FaceTime and we had to have a countdown so I could do it because you're so nervous. It's, it's good that you had that support yeah, to go through yeah. and, and get the get the needles in. Because when, you know, when when we made that first call and said, okay, your embryos from the first retrieval were, they were all aneuploid. So all the chromosomes, which means, which means chromosomes were not behaving as they should and that there were, you know, too many or too few. And then when we got to the second retrieval and we found, all right, you've 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 got a ton of embryos, but most of them really didn't pass the beauty contest right. very well. And that discussion was, hey, we we have these embryos. When we get to transfer, we're probably going to have to thaw all of them. And I think that was at the point where we talked about, do you want a second opinion? Because I never want people to feel like they're, they're stuck in the sense of, when you're going through all this, when you're spending this much money, right. you know, do you do you want to talk to somebody else outside of me 
just to get a little more perspective. And so you ended up doing that. I did. So my family pushed me to go. They're huge advocates of the Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. So I called you and I said, I love you so much, but my family does want me to go to Rochester, Minnesota and just get a second opinion. And I don't think I ever told you this, but you have a colleague there. Mm -hmm. And when I call, I kind of felt like it was meant to be because I called and I made an appointment with the Mayo Clinic like my parents asked. And I had an appointment with exactly the same doctor you told me to see. Mm -hmm. And when I hung up the phone from you, I just started crying. And I was like, this is meant to be, this is somebody, you know, and I went and I told her my story and she's like, Dr. B is right on. You guys are doing the right thing. Give it one more chance. And that's when I came back to Vegas and I said, okay, Let's do this final retrieval. Let's get these these perfect embryos and let's move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And I was trying to eat really well and I was doing everything to get these embryos. And when that final third retrieval happened and you called me and said, Annette, there's two perfect embryos and they're both girls. I was like, hallelujah, finally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, we had gotten multiple embryos out of that one. So the difference between our second cycle and our third cycle was that the the second cycle, the embryos were there, but they clearly did not pass the beauty contest. Right. And and many of them didn't pass the talent portion either. With the third one, they were they all passed the beauty contest. And so that makes it a lot more reassuring for us in saying, okay, these embryos have the components that we need. They have the trophectoderm, they have the inner, inner cell mass. So when we biopsy them, we've got more faith that they're going to do well on the other end. And then when we got the genetic testing back, so the talent portion, they looked good. And so when we got to the thaw date for you, right. it was really exciting yes. because I was initially worried like, oh my gosh, we're going to have to thaw multiple <laughs> embryos to get one that's good. And you thawed one and... That was my first question when I got in there. I said, we only thawed one, right? Uh -huh. And she said, yeah. I said, thank goodness. Okay, yeah. let's do this. Yeah. And now you just had your first ultrasound. I did. A couple days ago. Yes. So I'm six weeks so far. Yeah. And everything's easy peasy, no issues, no problems, and just eating two lunches. But other than <laughs> that's, that... That's okay. You deserve yes, to eat two lunches. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. But other than that, everything's going well. So I'm really, really glad I decided to go down this path. Um, if anybody can do it and anybody was groomed to do it, it was me. It's, it's me. I can handle it. I got a great team. I have you behind me. I have amazing parents. I have my friends. So I'm ready. So to go Annette, down. for people that are not as brave as you are, I mean, cause you have a lot of support and you're, you know, really, you just keep pushing forward. Tell me kind of how you felt. You were really nervous at the very beginning, given those injections. Right. You had to Facebook your support system to help <laughs> yeah. you with that. After you'd finished the first cycle, tell me kind of emotionally what you thought kind of, because obviously you were faced with, now I may have to do this again. What were your thoughts after you completed the cycle? Like thoughts before versus thoughts after? Going in, like I said, I was so nervous. I think I called Dr. B's office a hundred times asking so many questions. I needed to know exactly how to do these shots. I was so, so nervous. And then after I got through it, I thought, oh, I can do this. This is easy peasy. You know, you just got it. I think the hardest thing for me was I had to be home at a certain time every night. Mm -hmm. But other than that, once you got the it. The anticipation was worse yes, than the actual procedure yes, itself. Yes. And like I said, I can call Dr. B and she calls me immediately back or emails me immediately back. And I think that's huge with getting through this. A lot but of it you, is the reassurance right, and knowing, okay, I right, am doing this right. Right. I think a lot of people have that similar experience. We were talking yesterday about patients that we see they're really nervous about, you know, certainly IVF, but other things that they do. And I think when they get finished with it, they're like, you know, that, that really was wasn't easy. so bad after yeah. all, you know? Yeah. And I had a, I have a girlfriend at work and now I still have to do my progesterone shots and she did IVF. So every day at work, she gives me my shots. Oh. So it's so nice to have people close to you. And, you know, if you're thinking about doing this, just ask and talk and open up to other people because trust me, friends of friends and a lot of people, especially in their 30s, have to go through this to conceive. Unfortunately, I think it's sad, but it's so true. So what are you going to tell your baby about this? I know. So when I've been thinking girls about born. that. So, well, first of all, once I have her, I want to come back and I want to have, I'm ready for number two. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got I'm it. ready for number two. But I think 
and you know, I talked to my therapist about this too. I think what I'll say and how I'll go about it is, you know, I wanted, I wanted you so bad and I wanted to be a mom Mm -hmm. so bad that I asked God for you and, you know, he gave me you and happy and healthy. And, you know, we're just going to get through it together. And like I said before, I have two older brothers, not necessarily to play a daddy role, but to play a male role in my child's life. Plus my dad, who will be the most amazing grandpa ever. So I think I have things around me that, that will make this successful. Have you ever thought about, you know, in the wake of Ancestry.com and 23andMe about I your child know. doing that, maybe contacting the And that's fine. If that's, if that's what they want to do down the road, that's totally fine. So the first donor that I picked, he was, I can't remember, the, it's like closed. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So he no didn't contacts. want, yeah, he didn't want to be contacted. But this donor I chose from, I believe, Georgia, he want it's an open Oh, so if my child wants to down the road, you know, reach out to them, that's totally fine. I'm I'm all for that. So maybe it's fortuitous that we ended up having to switch to yeah. yeah. sounds like yeah. one because that way all your, your kiddo is going to have options. Yep, and that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I am so glad you came to talk to yes. us and I am so glad you are here and I am so glad that you are hungry and eating two lunches every day. Yes. <laughs> yes. There is a small human being inside. You're truly dictating. a ray of sunshine. Oh, thank you. Yes. So. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard feat, but you can do it. Yeah. You had a, you had a more complicated journey than most to be sure, but you, you just went through it and yep. chin up. And kept moving forward, even when it was hard, and even when there were days that you didn't want to. Yep. And I'm so glad that you have such a supportive family, and um, you know, powerful big mama, and supportive <laughs> daddy, and all your girlfriends yep. and brothers. And it's just, it's phenomenal. And you are Thank right you. where you want to be. Yes. And I'm so happy for you. Yep. Like I said, I'll be back for number two. Yeah. Well, as long as you bring back number one for cuddles, I would greatly <laughs> yeah. appreciate yes. that. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Annette. You're so we are welcome. So happy to have had you today. And this is Fertility Docs Uncensored with Dr. Abby Eblen, Dr. Susan Hudson, and I am Dr. Carrie Bedient. And have a wonderful day, y'all. Bye. Bye. We'll see you on the next one.